information, and this is something, I, I know this, is, this looks very complicated, but you don't understand it, some of you might have done it. Uh, information becomes a substitute capital. It used to be that you needed money, basically, to create something, right? I mean, you can still create, but uh, you needed uh, some kind of, some form of capital, for example, to release um, for some form of music. I said before, the fact that we are in a digital era makes that less expensive, but the other thing that's very interesting, you heard of this about Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and other platforms like that, is that what you can do, information becomes capital. You can just say, you know what, here's something I'm going to release. Is anyone interested? Here's a preview, or here's some part of the, maybe is a one track if you want to talk about music. Or obviously when we talk about product, it could be, okay, here's a mock-up, here's a prototype of what we're going to build. And more and more products have been created this way, where basically you don't need to actually have research done. This is where I say also that it's a specific market research. I'm going to put it out there, oh, to, to more than 10,000 people want to buy it, there's my market research, I've already done it. Okay. Make it maybe too simple, that's the idea. You don't need to have the entire process, you have a process very different. A process, by the way, which is uh, completely available to any one of us. You don't need to work in a major corporation to use a product, you can actually do that on your own. And of course, when I say that, I mean 3D printing. I don't know if you guys ever tried 3D printing, I actually did. I have a pair of shoes that's made from 3D printing, I ate food made from 3D printing, it's not that good, but I'm going there. The MIT was, has been able to create batteries made of 3D printing. I mean, batteries, I'm not talking about, this means that there's an actual chemical reaction within, and it's a battery, and it's 3D printed. If you can 3D print all this stuff yourself, either in the community space, or because the price will fall again, same thing with technology in your home, there's so much that you can do yourself that you don't need to go by the traditional method. This is something that is changing completely the, the, the shape of pro the way we do production. It is something that a lot of corporations that work with these corporations are very much afraid so. Because you suddenly imagine you're, none of you guys, I guess, when I say guys, by the way, I'm gender neutral. Very, very, gals, gals, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to offend any of the women in the space. Uh, when, when any of you guys was working in, in cars, I've been working with an automotive company the automotive company, they do money by selling you a car, but they do also money by selling you the, the, the parts. But if somebody can print all your parts, they don't go to a garage to actually make it fit it. That changes completely the revenue model for a car company because, oh wow, uh, people just, you know, they repair their cars themselves. They don't need us anymore. So that's a big, fat example. But you can apply that to a lot of stuff. Another, another thing as well is, uh, I mentioned it before in the way people do their own, um, I think it's a similar idea, this normal idea is, Air, I, I'm sure any, maybe you've tried Airbnb, similar thing. You're not going through a hotel, you're going directly to someone's place, where someone's place makes money of someone he owns. That changes completely the way you go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say that yeah, the same please. thing with Airbnb and hotels, this is what's happening here. We don't build a new music college, but we bring an expert and we crowdsource local knowledge. We'll call me an expert. It's exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're an expert. No, but I mean, this is exactly a DIT. You basically, and I've wrote here the extreme flattening of means of production is that you don't, again, big words, but you don't require to actually go through a company, go through a corporation, or even your, between yourself to create a company with a huge setup, a huge logistics, to be able to uh, make money and profit or just enjoy it. Because, by the way, it's a choice. You don't have to make money. I'm not here to say that everything has to, have, uh, has to make money, but it's a choice. You, you can do it yourself. And the more and more that happens, you mentioned Airbnb, uh, there's obviously uh, all the car sharing technologies. Again, I mentioned cars before. What happened? My car, I have a car in London. Pretty stupid, right? <laughs> I've actually calculated too, an Excel spreadsheet to say, okay, how much you actually use my car? And I realized that it stayed 94% of the time, it stayed in front of my house. Which makes it doesn't make sense. It sits there and its value is obviously degrading by day by day, just sitting in front of my house. So this is a bit stupid, right? So now, I haven't ne I've never yet shared, at least yet shared my car. But you can't actually share the car. I can say, uh, because no, that's the thing as well with technology. It used to be I used to have a whole people, but now marketplaces exist when I can say, you know what? I'm okay to rent my car for a day, an hour, a block of two hours, and decide what's my minimum and what's my maximum and what the availability. 
So if a lot of people start doing that, if that's happening, it's not uh, yet uh, all everywhere, but that's happening, then you know the need for a car is less. I don't need a car if I know that I can just tap into a car for someone else. I don't need to know who, by the way, who the car it is. It's just a car from someone on the marketplace. So now that's a good thing for consumers. Like, oh, great, you can have access to a car enough to buy one. And now put your, yourself in the shoes of a producer of car, like, oh, I'm not sending as many cars because nobody is actually buying anymore. Because if you go from 94%, the actual number, official, not official, but even some stats done is, 86, 80 to 86% of the car is not being used. If, on average, you guys, if you have a car, 80 to 86% uh, of the time the car is not being used. If everybody does that, that changes completely the game for corporations. This is why, you know, and this is one example, incumbents, so these companies that have been there for uh, decades are so afraid of all this because like, how are we, and I told you, I used to be a lobbyist. I know exactly the struggles we're seeing in all these fights have, are happening right now between lobbyists Ex me, people like me, so I should just try to say, oh, this is forbidden. You know, Airbnb is fighting uh, battles in every single city, is fighting battles in New York. Should they pay the tourist tax, etc., etc.? The fact is, this is a battle. And when you have a resistance and a battle, it actually means that something is clearly happening. Otherwise, nobody would actually talk about it. And lobbyists would not be involved either. <laughs> Values, that's well, a bit where I said here. You don't need to own stuff. I mean, the generation of my dad, and probably a little bit my generation, I was, I was still brought up in, my values were, okay, I'm defined by the car I have, the house, the TV, whatever, stuff, right? This was a way to define myself, which is normal. Probably my father came from an emerging country. Greece is still an emerging country, by the way. He was developing and he went back to being an emerging country, dummy. Uh, but the, Meaning that's a display of a lot of emerging countries, people from uh, poor origins show the display of wanting to acquire stuff. But still, this is changing. Uh, you are, more and more people agree, and I agree, to actually trade off ownership for access. The example I gave you with a car, with Airbnb, I said, oh, you know what, I can have a, a loft in New York instead of going to a hotel. Why not? I mean, it's someone's place. The same thing happens for co-working spaces. We are in one here. I've been in co-working when I'm traveling on the, on the road. I access co-working spaces. I'm only either to rent an office, and it, it, it can be, it, again, it doesn't have to be monetary. It can be banter. It can be, you know, in exchange for what I offer you, you can offer me something. It just always was possible. It's just that now you have actually tools that allow you to make that on a large scale. I can, before I used, uh, if I wanted to do that kind of banter, that kind of, of a barter story, I had to know that the person is like, okay, if I give you that service, can you give me one back? Now you do the same thing on a scale unmanageable because you can do that directly on your phone with marketplace existing. And so that changes, meaning it doesn't have to be about money, it can be, but that changes a lot the way what we, ac what we accept as a definition of ourselves. We don't need to own stuff. We can, we can uh, buy very much, very little, and then access the rest. So basically we value experience more. And if you think about it, we've always been there. One of the most what people are so happy about is not, yeah, people are very happy about their house. Of course, it's a big investment. Sometimes they brag about their car as well. I did not mention the brand of my car, maybe not something to brag about. But the main thing that people ex really value is experience, is vacation, right? More and more so, we value experience. Probably because we've been used to a lot of stuff, but it's also, it's also happening, again, I told you a little bit in Manila, same thing is happening in countries, again, with various stages. I'm not talking to someone extremely poor on the outskirts of the Philippines, actually talking the way I'm, do, the, the way I'm, I'm saying, though well, there's arguments about that. But what I'm trying to say here is that their experience is being valued more and more, and ownership is being valued less and less. And that creates new identities. This is something I've seen everywhere. I would call I put them in three blocks, travel, uh, we work in tribes, so we find people that have similar interests. And one of the examples I'm using is because it's key to me. When I was a kid, I mean, if you had tastes, if you had tastes in music, for instance, right? I was I was listening to Iron Maiden. Had long hair, yeah, whatever. That was me. But none of none of the kid was actually listening to that. So actually, you were actually either hiding. What you were, what you were, you were passionate, and that could um, just mention music. And music is a lesser devil because it could be about your sexual orientation. It could be a lot of stuff. You were hiding it. Whereas now, you know, that's bad parts, But now, 
with this access to, again, talking to strangers, you can see that it validates yourself. You can see, oh, you know what? I'm like that, but other people, especially as a kid being risen, uh, I have other kids actually do the same thing as me. I'm not an awkward kid anymore. I can be someone who actually has a commonality with other people. It validates what you think. It allows you as well, and as a society that's key, to have a people that are much more different, much more varied in their taste than used to be. You see that already. We've seen a change in social values in the past 20 years. We see more and more of this because, again, it validates how is it. I say it affects me because as a kid I was a little bit bullied. Not that this would have solved it, but I'm sure that if I had to, if I had found people that were like similar to me, that would have changed the dynamic of how it reacted. It looked like, oh, I'm alone in this world, nobody will help me, right? The traditional, uh, very um, uh, traditional example. Nomads, people move, they don't need to be in one place anymore. The definition of a home is actually changed. Co-working spaces and other, that's actually changing a lot. It's changing also the consumer and how people actually think. And Sigurd again, the, the self-construction. Because if you have validation, you can construct yourself more easily. You don't need to have, I'm not saying you, don't need, you, you won't have any mentors or ideals or people to uh, either emulate or follow. But you will be able to create, people will be, are able already to create their own personalities much more crisp. That actually the result is more creativity, I believe. Uh, so we live in a peer-to-peer -peer age, it's people to people. That's, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Not only are we producers, but we're more and more creators, as what I just said. Internet is a home, a city, a community, an experience. Internet is an agora. Agora is a term in Greek that means it was the, was the market, but the market not only of goods and services, the market of ideas. And that's exactly, I think, what the internet is becoming more and more. We still watch videos of cats, half cats, and half cats, so we keep doing it, but there are other stuff you can do, and I think it's going there. So the world is flatter. Uh, Friedman wrote, and uh, Thomas Friedman is uh, an author, wrote the world is flatter book about 15 years ago. I think the world is even flatter now because of these tools allow more peer to peer uh, um, um, networks. The world is efficienter, it doesn't make any sense in English, you're more efficient, I know, just look not nice with a slide to the ER. <laughs> and the third one, people, again, do not flame me when I'm going to say it because actually, the world is actually more capitalist, capitalist <laughs> Not in the sense of, because when I say people use the term capitalism, they think, oh, crony capitalism or corporate capitalism. So I hate the big guys and I want to be a small guy. This is not what I'm saying. Capitalism, at its very essence, is just the efficiency between supply and demand. I have something to offer. I work. I have a passion. It used to be that it was actually very hard and you had to find a nine to five jobs. I believe that all these tools that I've mentioned allow you to not go for the corporate traditionalism and go your own way. And actually, it might sound paradoxical, but I think the world is actually more capitalist because it allows you to have efficiency at the margins, to actually create stuff on your own without the help of anyone else. Now on music. So is, it, is the world music ER? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ER. Soon enough, all my slides will have ER at the end, and it will be very tough. This is a graph you probably know. A track, LP, EP, tape, and CDs. This is the evolution from uh, 73 to 2009. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty clear, right? If I, if I were to follow to 2013, the CDs were very, very, very low. Uh, some people would say, oh, the LPs have a revival. Yeah, right. I mean, they have a revival as a tool of, for collectors and DJs, but there are none on this graph. I didn't put the digital because I'm coming in a minute, but if I had put the digital, it actually also looks this way. It also looks, there's a downward spiral. iTunes. Although iTunes grew last year, iTunes the spent per user fell by 24 24%. So the spent per person on iTunes, and I took iTunes because it's a very good benchmark of digital downloads because it's still the major player by very large in terms of downloads. Uh, not in terms of streaming, I'll come in a minute, but in terms of download. Per user, there's a 24%. So basically, a quarter, you and me will put, uh, have put a quarter less money in buying digital downloads. Why is that? Obviously because of the next wave. The next wave means Spotify and other tools like that, which are uh, the streaming ones. But as you know, maybe even if you don't, this is the reality. For to equal 100 self-pressed CDs that you would do and actually try to sell, to have the same amount of money in earnings, you'll have to you know, uh, have nine, uh, 900 iTunes downloads, but for a million Spotify, Spotify plays. 
I mean, we've all heard about the controversy, but it's not exactly the, very, the equation is not very uh, good towards uh, musicians. So Spotify and again, digital downloads are down. Is Spotify down? We, the numbers are very obscure for uh, for streaming. We don't know exactly where it is. Meaning, does it replace the f the, f the fall in digital downloads that we're experiencing over the world? It's still not sure. The thing is, that's why I call it fallacy. Music was actually never owned. There's a good thing. Has any one of you ever given a resume or CV to? Uh, Recruiter and employer. Uh, no, 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 I was going to ask you a question. Yeah, please go. Um, you sorry. say that. Um, sorry, you you just to use the microphone. The microphone. <laughs> yes. Tom. Bring my microphone. Not on cameras. <laughs> go ahead. Please. Sorry for that. Yes. No, you, um, you said that um, digital download, the sales, are going down. Yes. Um, so is Spotify. <clears throat> we don't know. Is Spotify compensating for that? I mean, Spotify is clearly, Spotify and others, Rhapsody. Um, um, and the others. So Deezer and others. Yeah. They're, they're obviously the reason, I mean, I've been, I've, um, to be very honest, if you hate Spotify, I'm sorry. I was in a very early, I was a beta user of Spotify. I had access to Spotify in the, uh, early 2009. Since then, I haven't opened iTunes a single time. So I'm not saying that everyone does that. I'm saying it's true that the ease of use of having music at your fingertips is so easy and you don't have to wait for a download. And the same time I say that, in a, and I'm a fan of lossless type of formats, so I don't have that on, on, on quality. So we're not sure if, that, if that's, if I understand if there's a question well, we're not sure if it compensates. We're pretty sure from what the majors are telling me, you know how the majors are, they're saying, oh, we don't, we're not making enough money with Spotify. But is that true? We don't know. What we don't know, and I'm talking about your side, about the creator side, is the fall in downloads being replaced by the use of streams? Is it compensated at equal value? We're not sure. Because some of the numbers, these companies are not public. Spotify is not public. It might, be, might go public, I'll come to you in a second. It might go public by the end of the year, but then we'll have better understanding of the dynamics, but we don't. Sorry, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, so it's to do with your with that topic. Uh, I don't know the numbers either, but I can tell you one little trend. Let's say big trend in Scandinavia. Basically, no one downloads anymore. Yeah. It's only streaming, and in a, in a big, big way. So, I would sure. I would I would think that th there's a big rise in streaming, but uh, I don't know the numbers either. Yeah. No, this clearly. Any honest, if any of you has ever used any tools to to uh, Spotify was. What was good about Spotify, besides the deals they've done, is the, the technology itself. I mean, it, it was done by uh, a guy who used to code a, a tool called uTorrent in Mac, which was uh, torrenting, which is one way to actually illegally download music and all the kind of content. But it is for Spotify. It was, it's so quick. And that's the reason people get hooked to that. And I'm the first one guilty here. But we'll come back after that in, in the discussion, if you want. Ask if you if you gave uh, a, uh, a resume to a recruiter ever in your life. Have you ever printed a resume yeah. in your life? Right? It's proven that I don't have a piece of paper. Never mind. It's proven that if you print this, the resume on an 80 milligram piece of paper on the same resume on a 110 milligram piece of paper, so a thicker piece of paper, you'll be more credible on the on the thicker one than the middle one. It's <laughs> it's a human behavior. Then you when you touch something, you value it more. That's, that's about it. You touch a piece of paper that is heavier, you think, wow, that's bad, that was solid, right? So it would, like with, with wood. When it was Ikea, I love Ikea, I Ikea stuff, but when you see like a big piece of wood, you're like, oh, this is solid. And you, so you value internally without thinking, you value it more, right? And of course I say that because we used to buy I have a huge collection of, I mentioned Iron Maiden, sorry, I have a huge collection of Iron Maiden LPs <laughs> and CDs. Why? Because you own, you know, I touch them, it's, they are mine, and I refuse to actually sell them. I mean, yeah, my wife wishes, I, I hope I would, but they, it's because, you know, I touch it. There's this relation, we never had a relation with music, and I'll say, again, and I'll come to that in a minute, but the main relation in terms of pricing, besides the dynamics of what's the price, because the major the recording studios wanted that kind of price, it's because we were touching it. We were touching a piece of plastic that was an LP, which is with its cover in, in paper, or a piece of plastic with another piece of plastic, which was, uh, which was a CD. This is a relationship. So, of course, when you remove this, 
then suddenly the value, it seems that the value is less. And I know that a lot of musicians say, oh, people have been de uh, devalued in music. And I say, no, they have not devalued music. They have just devalued, in, you know, the, without realizing they, they lost the physical connection between them <coughs> and the music. The music, by the way, was never owned because it was a copyright, so it's, but that's another, that's another matter. And that happens in everything we uh, just put here, plus I here, because I could have chosen whichever. Same thing, any type of content is purely vir vir virtual, right? You experience the content. You don't own the content. You can own the DVD of, you know, um, um, Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. You can own the DVD, but you don't own the content. Same thing actually for a car, especially luxury cars. You pay for the luxury cars for, a luxury car is virtual. There's only a fraction of its price is actually the real value of the car. The rest is about either status, bragging rights, whatever. But these are so stu the goods were always virtual in a sense. We just didn't realize. And it just happened to be that music and content in general was the first where this physical relation between the content and the, the purchase behavior was, was switched off. And thus, this kind of you were the first ones uh, as, as musicians to experience that, oh wow, people do not like, they, they don't value music anymore. It's really like cats and dogs. And so. so music can be, their, it can be their value, if you think about where it is, because we value meaning. We don't value, I never valued, I mean, okay, some of the LPs, I mean, the covers are great to look at, but at the end of the day, I value the music in my head, right? It's the music I want to listen to. I just want to watch your LP for the whole day just sitting there. I want to actually listen to the music. So we value the meaning of, of music. But music always had meaning. Uh, this was a talk given at, and I'm not a professional sound, that was not the point, but I, I will send you the link or ask uh, Tommy. Um, I helped the guys at TEDx Athens. And this guy, I didn't know him, he's called Panos Karam. Uh, he's a pianist. I'll tell the story very quickly to make the story short. He was a very early virtuose, and his only dream was to go to Carnegie Hall. Uh, and he thought about that dream, and suddenly, very early, uh, I think he was, I don't, I'm not sure, was he maybe 23, 21 or something? He went to Carnegie Hall. And he said suddenly, like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> right? That was, you know, the ultimate goal for a pianist, and it's already done. So. The meaning, and this is the reason I say that, is that Sony, and I really encourage you to watch that talk, it's one of the most moving talks I ever heard. This, this guy once decided to go start music, playing music in prisons in, you know, in IT after the earthquake. In Japan after the earthquake, when visiting the people next to the radioactive, radioactive uh, region, he went to all these places where people were sad, were you know, touched by catastrophes. And he's, he brought his piano, and he played piano for this guy. And he tells a story, I'm going to not tell him, because you know, I'm not him, and I've not done something as extraordinary as he does, as he did. But that's the point. Music here was the experience of the music, the fact that he went there, both for the musician, him, as himself, and for the people that listened to him. The music always had meaning. And in that case, it changed the world. We value, again, when it touches us, the feeling it creates, the story that I just told you create, uh, touched me, same, same thing with music, what touches me. And you know, I mentioned these three terms, you know, tribal, no, but so basically it creates identity. Music is probably the only thing in the world where people are, you know, identify so much with something. Okay, you might identify with James Bond or something, but you don't. I've never seen as many people identify as much as something that with music. You dress the part. You know, you actually dress the part. Look, music is an entity. That's me. I'm fucking <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> You don't see the ACDC t-shirt. It's, I wouldn't have done that for anything else. We, we identify with music. When I'm, when I'm driving, really, 8% of the time, I'm listening to BBC3, I love classical music. I'm on, I'm, Sometimes I'm like, I, sh I have to switch it off because I, I forget where I am, you know? It's, I'm so into the, that moment that I forget where I am. This, the, 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 the touch, the, the feeling that it creates into it, you all know that, that's why you decided to be musicians. There's something that no other, I started to go back to more dry terms, 
no other industry in the world has. None other can have this kind of impact on people. We identify to music to a point that is almost extreme. Like I said, we value the experience, uh, the rise of luxury. Remember when I said the rise of luxury, that luxury becomes more important? Because there's luxury rising ownership because this is, the, this is actually the experience. The experience is a luxury. If you understand that, you've got it all. If you have to get that a minute in a bit more detail, and sorry, I'm not going to be too long uh, anymore, but the luxury part that the rise of, you know, I mentioned before, that luxury is one of the key parts that is still going very strong in the world, is because people, when you say luxury, they want, they want access. They want, it's not ownership. It's a bragging rights of the car, which is virtual. It's a bragging rights maybe of having a phone, because some of you said it was luxury or not acting. It's the experience. This is what people pay for. They pay the reason they're still okay to pay for such a phone at such a high price is because of the experience. And also because it brings all these it's the experience. That's luxury. Is that luxury is not having a, just a, you know, a logo that says Hermes or Prada. It's the access to the, to the experience. Music was always an experience. I know that's the third type of music I'm going to mention, but if you, if you ever go to uh, uh, electronic, uh, uh, I was a I was, month ago, I was in Dubai, that was just insane. Because you're right there, and this is an, this is an experience that nobody can uh, shoot me away from. Nobody will ever steal that from me, because I was there and I was completely in it. The same thing when I'm in my car with classical music. That's actually really the same, the same type of feeling. That's Armin van Buren, by the way. Um, so basically what happens is that the world, it's not, you, it's not music that has a problem, it's that the world is finally adopting the same dynamics that music always had. The dynamics of identity, the dynamics of access, the dynamics of experience, the dynamics of, of meaning. The world that I'm mentioning is actually catching up to the world of music and not the other way around. So that is really, it's great, but what do you do? Of course, one of the movements I said, mu musicpreneur, I think this is what the reason I'm here. Uh, because I really, truly believe that there's something to it. I said that in the very beginning, I'm going to skip it. The amount of progress computers will make in the next few years is equal to the progress they have made since the very beginning of the existence of computers. We are not the computers anymore. These are the key things that will, people will value, and whether it's in jobs or in a society. It's adaptability, lateral thinking, emotional intelligence, and creativity. These four keys are what will make basically, if you look at the, I could show you numbers, I don't want to because be boring. The same, in the similar way as I told you before, that half the jobs, existing jobs, might disappear. Those jobs that will not disappear actually all have something about that. There are jobs of communication, passion, there are jobs of relationships. These are, and this is stuff that actually already exists in music. Average is over, you cannot be average anymore, not only because of what I said, but also because earlier I told you oh, the pond is much larger and we have other people actually wanting to do the same thing, so the average, average is over. This is why I want to go some points like that. Oops. Technology innovation is the main process by which luxury items you can produce. Well, okay, I'll leave it. I don't. Luxury, this is a uniqueness. This is something you, what music, musicians, have to understand. Luxury is uniqueness. It's scarcity. I mentioned before me being in, in, in a concert of, of Armin van Buren in his, in, his, in his life set. That, I, I, I repeat, that cannot be stolen from me. This is the uniqueness. Now, this is a luxury. Now, this is the scarcity. It was only happened once one day. It could never happen again. And I was there and I enjoyed it. Same thing when I was listening to Panos Karan doing his talk in, at TEDx Athens. We actually, I was in the front seat and gave that talk uh, about him going with his piano around the world and helping people. That was this moment. You can watch the video, but that moment, the emotion I felt that moment, well, nobody can see it from me and nobody can actually express it again. I mean, you can hear him in other places, but these are the moments, this is the real luxury. And if you can create that scarcity, as musicians or content creators, this is where, actually, if I went back to money, this is where the money is. This is in that scarcity. You have to transform music into a luxury experience. I'm not going to do that because I could talk about gratification more by the word nature, if that's, I'm sorry, my phone is actually done. <coughs> Here you go. So, what you, what you can do is, uh, 
experiment, what I would encourage you to do is experiment, experience. When I say experiment, experience is like, there's so much things people can do today with all the tools that, you know, we talk about the specific tools that exist, you know, from the, you know, the marketplaces of SoundCloud. But this lateral thinking I was telling you about, think about not only, and I know I'm talking a bit too maybe tactical for people that think that music should only be a heart, a heart or a passion. But you can do stuff laterally. You can start to say, oh, you know what? I, I, I'm doing music, but I know this other guy that actually does art. I know this other guy that actually has a startup that just started. I know this guy, for instance, I know a guy who's doing a startup that matches, a marketplace that matches uh, uh, bars and pubs with musicians. That's one. But uh, think about, stop thinking about this. Think about the other ways you could actually uh, reach uh, through, through other people. This is one way. The experiments always they overlap. Like I said, without innovation overlapping, you know, crashing on top and all the la new layers of innovation being added. That's the same way I think that uh, successful entrepreneurs think. They add stuff on top of the other. Everything is a remix. It's very appropriate because we're talking about music. But everything is a remix. There's no shame to get reuse part that was already done and trying to remix it in a different way to actually make a new experience. This is exactly what I would recommend you. Experiment with other entrepreneurs, as I said. One example, and I know it's not the best one because we're looking like a big star, but there's this studio, you've probably heard about it, Studio XO here in London. They are the ones, they are a startup, they do technology, but they, they, these are the guys designing most of Lady Gaga's outfit. Lady Gaga went there and said, okay, I want, you know, she's a persona, she created a, a completely insane persona around, around her, but she went to a startup in London and said, okay, what can you do? to create that experience. I want people when they go to my concert, they have this experience. And they created these crazy outfits. If you go to Studio XO, I think it's here in the UK, and we just, we, you'll see some of these outfits. This is not the best example, because obviously the Gaga by the time was already kind of famous. But what I'm trying to say here is that she went laterally, she went to, to see other avenues to create an experience. That's the way I think musicians that actually want to make it in terms of uh, at least revenue should think, should, should think about. Is actually dying. Uh, so of course leverage your network, like what I said before, I'm not going to go there. I, I advise startups, experiment fast, experiment often, it's okay if you fail, fail fast and fail often. This is the one a lot of people say, you fail fast, fail often. I always like to add rework fast and rework often. Rework is the science of when you've done something right, just reuse it. Because a lot of people insist too much on the failures, which is great. We fail, we fail, we fail, we stumble, we fall, we get up, we start again. But you know what? It's also, also, also great when you succeed and to say, yeah, you have bragging rights and actually reuse that experience as well. So you can do it. You can go very quickly. And the, the most successful startups I've worked with, the, re, the, the, the success is never overnight. It's because they've done through, they went through that iteration. Failure, success, failure, success, failure, success, until something started working. And the same way, lateral thinking, you know, you have to be both, and I know it's a bit paradoxical, you have to be a focus, you know, the map of the compass. You have to have a map, you know probably where you want to go, and a compass, you live by the compass. Suddenly, you know, that's a dead end, I'm going somewhere else. This, this is the way most of entrepreneurs, probably music entrepreneurs, should, should think. I do crazy shit, basically, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, how, all this was about trying to unlock a little bit what we how we think. Uh, I love this word. Only two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity. I'm not sure about the former. Sure. Why, why am I using that? Is because of the next sentence. Is This is the one, I'm, and I honestly, I'm, I'm not moving aside on purpose. I've honestly heard this thing in corporations from marketing people, I'm talking chief marketing officers. I've heard that from so many people, you know, probably an older generation, they, they tell me, Ah, the internet is going to go away. Now, the internet is not going to go away, right? <laughs> so this is what I'm saying. This is why you said I'm saying for the internet and all I said about these networks, it's not going to go away. You know what? Music labels, are, uh, the major ones, I'm sure they were like, ah, oh, well, we should come back to what it was before because we were making money in the way. And the reason they're still they're, they're struggling so much is that they don't accept, for most of them, they don't accept to change a business model to a new reality. This is why they hit you on Spotify. If we could go back to the, to the Spotify question, I cannot, there's some stuff in the aid, but Spotify pays shitloads of money to major to record labels 
Why? Because record labels, they, own, they, they still structure their thinking around the same model they used to. They're not, they haven't, and it's not Spotify's fault, partially it is to play with the same dynamic, they just pay a big check, write a big check, and that's it, and then the record label just applies the same algorithm that they used to from previous models, and hence the artist gets screwed over, over that, uh, that, that algorithm. This is basically it. It's just, so this exactly, but when you talk to these major incumbents, oh, the internet's going to go away. No, it's not. I'm so sorry, but it's not. Ah, and this is the block, the mental block we all have. The idea of the future being different from the present is so repugnant to our conventional modes of thought and behavior that we, most of us, offer a great resistance to acting out in practice. That means that's true. All of us are like that. We are, we don't like change, we're afraid of change. I'm like that, you know, it's easy for me here to pontificate and be like standing in front of you making a nice talk with my slides and stuff. It's hard. I've been hitting hard times for myself all, a, a lot. I was an entrepreneur, I've been mean, times where I had like only 10 pounds on my bank account. Okay, it was not pounds, it was not a currency, but you just <laughs> knew. Uh, it was still bad, you kind of the same, but change is extremely hard. And it's hard to project yourself into the future, whatever you want to say it is. But I believe, from what I've said before, that there's actually no real choice because there will be no other providers, or whether it's job creativity, uh, of, um, success, whatever you want to define success. Um, basically, 